Hello everyone and welcome to the Hello everyone and welcome to this video. Today I would like to talk about a very important component and it's called the electrical diode. You have probably heard about it before. I will talk about how it works, how you could use it, and at the end as a bonus I will tell you why you should always put a resistor before an LED in any circuit. I have um, divided my video into chapters so you could just jump in into a point if you want to get to it quickly. So let's get started. The first thing I would like to talk about is the atom, because in order to show you how a diode works, I should review some important aspects of an atom. And this is by the way a diode, but I will just talk about it in the middle of this video. By then I would have told you some important things about the atoms and so. The atom is of course the smallest building block of the universe. Air had atoms, ketchup or even water have atoms. Just anything that's real in our universe consists of atoms. An atom is very, 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 very small. It actually doesn't, it's not that big I can see it at the moment, but it doesn't look like this even. I so tried I... to draw the real shape of an atom, but it turned out to be an egg omelette, but this shall be the real shape of an atom. Of course, internally, an atom consists of some elements, of which are protons, which have positive electric charge, neutrons, which have neutral charge, and electrons, which have negative electric charge. You can imagine an atom as a tall hotel. Each floor takes a certain number of residents. Similarly, in an atom, there are electron orbits. Each orbit takes a certain number of electrons. The first takes only two, the second takes eight, and the third takes 18, but it's preferable to take only eight and so. What differentiates an atom's element from the other is the atom size, the number of electrons, but what decides how this atom reacts is mainly the number of electrons in the last orbit or floor. This is the shape of a non-metal atom, and in the last orbit its number of electrons is either 5, 6 or 7. Keep in mind that any atom need to have only 8 electrons in its last outer shell. That's why non-metals atoms tend to gain electrons to fill its orbit with 8 electrons. Yet on the other hand, metals are the inverse. Metal atoms have either 1, 2 or 3 electrons in its last orbit or the last floor. Metals would just throw away its last electrons and will depend on the last 8 electrons the floor before the last one has. There are other elements which have exactly 4 electrons in the outer shell. Those have certain properties and some of them are called the semiconductors. Some of them has exactly 4 electrons in the last floor, so the atom can't really decide whether to lose its electrons or gain electrons. Of course all of this is greatly simplified for the sake of simplicity, that's why if you like the topic you can google and find other YouTube videos talking in full details about chemistry, because you know, I'm not a chemistry teacher. Electricity is nothing except the movements of electrons from high concentrations to free electron holes, which are positively charged. And if any substance have freely moving electrons, like all metals, it shall conduct electricity. In short, an electron is negatively charged and a hole, which have no electrons, are positively charged and the electrons will jump from its place and go to the positive charge holes. Now my concentration will be about the silicon atom, because it's one of the most used substances in diodes and transistors. This is by the way the real photo taken with a huge microscope to show you how small an atom is. Of course silicon from the semiconductor's family and the last electron orbit of it have exactly 4 electrons. There is a very interesting thing that happen when you inject pure silicon crystals with some elements or impurities, and this process is called doping by the way. Some silicon atoms are ripped off the crystals and other elements atoms replace it. A good example is the boron element which when injected to the end reactions and sensitive things happen, at the end these doped crystals will have electrons holes ready to receive electrons and are positively charged. Not only boron does this but other elements like aluminum, gallium and indium. 
These crystals are called the P type crystals and I think that P just stand for positive. Another cool thing that happened to the pure silicon crystals when other elements are injected into it in the doping process, this time let's take phosphorus as an example, again after a sensitive process, uh, oh yeah by the way this is not the real shape of crystals or anything, just the imaginary shape I have in my brain, because you know everything is just simplified. What happens to these crystals is that they will have a free moving electron which want to move and get to holes which are positively charged and these crystals are of course negatively charged due to the presence of electrons and we call these crystals the n-type crystals. When you put the n-type crystals and the p-type crystals beside each other, a diode is created. Yeah, too simple. Uh, anyways, there is a cool thing that happened in the point of the contact of these two crystals. The electrons in the n-type crystals move toward the holes in the p-type crystals, but due to some physical and chemical limitations, this happened only in a small part. And what's more astounding is that when the electrons leave the n-type crystals, there will be positive holes in the boundary of the n-type region. And of course there will be electrons in the boundary of the p-type region. And this middle region is called the depletion region. This depletion region is what makes the diode work. When you hook up a battery to the diode connecting the positive terminal to the p-type region and the negative terminal to the n-type region, what happens is that the depletion region shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until the electrons could flow through the diode's n and p crystals, and the diode will act just as a wire which have a very low ideally 0 ohm resistance. And of course the reverse is true. If you hooked up the battery's positive terminal to the N region of the diode and the negative terminal to the P crystals of the diode, the depletion region grows bigger and bigger and bigger and no electrons will flow, thus no current or anything will flow and the diode will act just as the air which doesn't conduct electricity. Playing with diodes with high current and or high voltage power supplies, like the one in the computers, for example, is very dangerous because it could get. <laughs> to sum up, a diode is an electric device which passes the electric current in only one direction, and this is the symbol of a generic diode. The side which have this vertical line is the negative side, while the one which have an arrow pointing to the right is the positive side. Conventional current, which is the type of current, will flow alongside the arrow, but if reversed, it will be blocked and won't flow. A diode, in order to work and to overcome the depletion region, has to have a certain voltage across it, which should be more than 0.7 volts, and this is called the forward voltage of a diode. This means also that if you connected the positive side to the diode to a 5 volts for example, on the negative side will get only around 4.3 volts. If you hooked up a multimeter to measure the voltage drop of a diode, connecting the multimeter to the diode terminals, you will again read a 0.7 volts across it. This number is affected by the diode type, the current flowing through it, it could be 0.6, maybe 0.9, or maybe more or less. And ideally, a diode when forking should have a resistance of 0 ohms. Now quickly I would like to talk about the types of diodes. The most known type is the rectifier diode, another one is called the Schottky diode, and the only difference is that its forward voltage is less than the one of the rectifier diode. Other types of diodes are the Zener diodes, which are used as voltage regulators. And another type is the LED. An LED is the abbreviation of light emitting diode. 
الميتنج بيمو واحده او يا سوري What differentiates the diode from another is how much current it could withstand before exploding or melting, also its forward voltage which makes it work, and also other things like the maximum reverse voltage you could apply into it before exploding in your face. Now under this magnify picture, I can tell you that the white side which have this line identifies the negative side of the diode. And also, this is an LED or LED. Now I would like to do some tests on the diode to have. Nowadays, any new multimeter you buy probably has the forward voltage measuring functionality. Mine has one and I will measure the forward voltage of some diodes I have. You could test the diode using this method by the way. It didn't work. Uh, oh yeah, I put it in reverse. As I said before, the white line indicates the negative terminal of a diode. And here it is measuring around 0.6 volts. I think that this fat diode is a shot key diode and uh, yep, it's a shot key diode measuring a forward voltage just at 0.4 volts. Here I will measure the forward voltage of some light emitting diodes and this is about um, 2.6 volts which is the white color LED. I will get another LED, a yellow color this time, and it measures around 1.8 volts. Diodes have lots of usages everywhere and every second. And every second, one of the known usages for a diode is to convert AC voltages to DC voltages, which is happening right now if you are watching this video on a desktop computer. If you open the power supply of your computer, you will find different diodes everywhere. Also diodes are used in many applications in solar panels. And I also suggest that an Arduino Uno for example uses diodes for protection reasons. So if you connected a battery backwards, nothing get barbecued. Or if you connect a battery and at the same time you connect a USB cable into your Arduino Uno, your house doesn't go on fire. And lastly, until I publish the electronic basics episode about transistors, keep in mind that a transistor is actually two diodes connected backwards. Now I will make a very small experiment. I will hook up the diode to a 5V USB cable, but of course I will put a 1 kilo ohm resistor before it, because a diode is a short circuit when it's working. Normally when you would like to calculate the resistance in this circuit, ignoring the diode as it will be just a wire, a short circuit, so we just divide the 5 by 1000, which will result in 5 milliamps of current being drawn. But this is wrong, because basically I told you that a diode drops a voltage across it. So the voltage across the resistor will not be 5 volts, but 4.3 volts, which means that after dividing the voltage by the resistance, you will have 4.3 milliamps of current being drawn. Now I'll put my multimeter in current measurement mode, so I can measure the current being drawn from my circuit. And as you can see it's roughly 4 milliamps and if I uh, decrease the range of the multimeter to get more precise um, answer, it's just 4.3 milliamps. Normally when you hook up the diode in reverse, there should not be any current being flown, but actually there is, and it's around 20 nanoamps, which is very small. 
Now I will tell you why you should always put a resistor before an LED and it's simply because an LED is a diode and you should put a current limiting resistor before any diode so that the diode is not short circuiting everything and it doesn't pop up a mold. At this point, I would like to end this video. I hope you really enjoyed it. If so, don't forget to drop me a comment below, maybe subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned because I will soon upload the next part of this video. Thanks for watching. Hello. Important is the basis of a lot of things, and you will use it in the future, and I will use it. I will Oh, in a mood. Hello, every. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, come, 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 welcome.